note today, just don't forget if you have any prayer requests, right in the seat back in front of you is a little white card with a red strip across the top and we pray different times throughout the week for the prayer needs of the folks here. Um, and if you have a prayer request, just uh, drop that in the offering this morning on your way out in the offering box. You'll notice it's one of the things we do different here is, is that we have um, a tithe box in the, in the entryway. We don't take up an offering in a traditional way. We have a tithe box and it's there for you and we encourage you to be a participator in what we do here. It's how we do what we do. We don't get outside resources to do what we're doing. We get them from the people that come and become a part of this church. And we're able to do what we do because of that. So thank you so much for doing that. Before I forget, um, anyone that can stay immediately after church, we're removing a piano off the stage just as some uh, maintenance stuff. Piano, I got the note right here. I almost forgot. Big. I don't think you could have gotten it any bigger unless it was just like... Whoa. Okay, but anyway, we're going to move that off. We need some guys to be able to just slide it from over there and put it onto a, a dolly that we have available. So if you can do that, we'd sure appreciate it. And you can see Gary raise your hand. He will help you. Those of you that are online, you're welcome to come on down and join us. Yeah, Eric's going to carry it off. We're going to try to get Eric to carry it by himself off. We want to see that. All right. Well, I invite you this morning to open your Bibles and, or your Bible app to the uh, sixth chapter of the book of Ephesians, where we find ourselves at verse 17, the first half of this verse we dealt with last week on the message about the helmet of salvation, and now the second half of the verse we come to the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. If you are visiting here with us or online for the first time, we are on a journey of study together in the book of Ephesians, specifically the area where the Apostle is writing about spiritual warfare and the armor of God. Over the past few weeks, we together have gained a greater insight into what the armor of God is and why it is so important in the life of the follower of Christ. This is not an armor that is available for a non-believer. This is an armor that God has made available for His children alone. And we've been learning about this armor and this gift that God has given to us. We have learned that at the very moment we made a decision to become a child of God, we became two people at one time. Both a friend of God and an enemy of the evil one. We found peace with God, but we found hostility and a war uh, with the evil one. The warfare in which we are engaged is not against flesh and blood. The battle that is taking place is a spiritual one. It is for this reason that the Apostle Paul reminds us through this letter written to this first century church, that the armor that we are given is not natural or physical, but it is spiritual. And when we put on the armor, this is, an, is essentially putting on Christ. Because our strength for this battle is drawn from the power of Christ and is found in Christ and in our relationship with Him. As we will see today, Jesus Himself had to fight the battle against Satan when he was on the earth with the sword of the Spirit, the power of his Father's words. This week, we now move from the armor to the weapons, and I suggested last week that there are two weapons that God has given us for this spiritual war, and we see them mentioned in verse 17 and 18 of Ephesians 6, the first of which is the sword of the Spirit, and the second is the is prayer. So let's read this together in Ephesians 6, 17, and 18. And he says this, it says, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all 
the saints. I find it interesting as kind of a side note that when we see the New Testament church being birthed or formulated in the first days in the history of the church, in the first few chapters of the book of Acts, it is specifically noted, if you remember, when the church was growing, and it tells us that they were at one time added 5,000 people to church in one day, and it began to multiply and grow, and the original apostles were serving people because there was a lot of people that had physical needs and they were taking up you know, all of these gifts and giving it out to people that had specific needs and they found themselves doing this all the time. And they said, we can't be doing this. We need to find people that are full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And that became the first, as we call them, deacons, uh, servants that were helping the church. And they said the reason they did that is they said, because we need to devote ourselves to the ministry of the word and prayer. So they focused on these two weapons in the early days of the formulation of what we know now as Christianity. These two weapons are vital to our success and to the success of the church as a whole in the spiritual war. The Apostle Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians 3, uh, uh, 10 verses 3 and 5, that we are not in a battle of flesh and blood, but we are in a battle, a warfare that is not carnal. In other words, it is not uh, natural or visible, but it is invisible. But we have weapons that are available to us. They're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing. It's interesting, he says, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God or anything that comes against you and I that opposes the plan of God, the will of God, or the message of Jesus Christ that you and I know. That's an enemy. How subtle it may be, whether it's small or great, whether it's a seed form or whether it's the entire tree, it doesn't matter if it's, if it's not in agreement with the Word of God and it's not in agreement with God's will and purpose, then it is an enemy of the church and it's an enemy of you. The Bible clearly says that. The war that the Apostle Paul is describing, which we need to understand, is really a war of the mind. It's a war of the heart. It's a battle in the mind. Are you going to believe this or are you going to believe that? Are you going to embrace this concept and this thinking, or are you going to embrace that? This is a battle of ideologies, a battle of thoughts, battle temptation of thought. Many things to draw us away from God. It's anything that will draw you away from your relationship and dependence in Christ to something that is of the world. So we understand because he who controls the mind of a person controls the person. That's how you win or lose. This is why we have to guard our minds and protect our thoughts. That's why the helmet is so important. The helmet of salvation that God has given to us to protect our minds from things that oppose the will and the purpose of God. I don't know about you, but I just like to say here, I don't trust my own thinking. I don't trust my own instinct. My own heart. Follow your heart. No, don't. Because that's not going to work. The Bible doesn't tell us to do that. To follow the instruction of the Word of God. I don't trust it. I trust the Bible. I trust the Word of God. I don't trust anybody else. Trust the Word of God. doesn't mean people are out there intentionally trying to lead you in the wrong way or do these things, but I believe, yes, there are people out there that are intentionally trying to lead you in the wrong way. And if you think they're not, you're already deceived. They may not even know they are. That's why they're deceived. See, because if you knew you were deceived, guess what? You wouldn't be deceived. Right? How do we keep ourselves from being deceived? Right here. Friends, people around, holding us accountable, challenging our belief, challenging what we learn, challenging what we do. That's why in the kingdom of God, isolation is not a principle that God supports. Isolation is what causes our problems. 
We need to be together. Everybody say, we need to be together. So the question we need to answer today is, when Paul, the, when Paul is encouraging us to take the helmet and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, what does that mean? What is the Word of God that he is talking about here that is the sword for the believer? First off, let's look at this sword that is being used as a visible picture that came from his uh, understanding and experience of the Roman legionnaire, the army of his day, he used their armor as an example, the Roman sword the Apostle Paul is talking about is a short sword, as you see here. It's not a long, broad sword that I mentioned last week when talking about the helmet. The sword that is being used illustratively here is called a makara or a makara in, a, in a, their day. As you can see, it's a one handed, double edged sword made of solid steel. So it didn't matter how you held it or how you picked it up, it would work. It's not just one side that has the sharp blade on it, but it's both sides so that in a battle, a hand-to-hand -hand combat, if you dropped it in the midst of your battle, you could pick it up. It wouldn't matter what side you use because both sides serve their equal purpose. This sword was used for close hand-to-hand -hand combat. It was not designed for stabbing like a dagger. This sword was designed for hacking. It was, it, was a, it was a destroying weapon. It was designed to take out the legs, take out the arms of the enemy. The sword was designed to hit the neck. Either way, the bottom line to this sword is to stop the enemy from being able to advance, to take them and remove them from the ability to fight and take them out. The sword, when properly used and properly trained how to use this sword, was deadly. This was, like I said, it was not a stabbing sword because you understand the armor that these people had on. It wasn't you could walk up and stab them in the chest or anything. They had, they had shields and they had the ability to block that. This was a, a sword to hack and create damage that way. The Bible tells us that we look here at this Roman legionnaire, it was the only offensive weapon that he had for hand-to-hand -hand combat. For us, in a spiritual sense, it is our most powerful offensive weapon against the enemy's attacks. When used properly and trained how to use it, combined with the power of prayer, it destroys any and all attacks against the evil forces of the darkness of this age. It will destroy it and pull it down. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. And I don't want to look at, overlook an important point here. This is the sword of the Holy Spirit. The sword of the Holy Spirit. It is the tool that the Holy Spirit uses to impact the natural visible world with the spiritual invisible world. We know Jesus spoke many times about the Holy Spirit's job was to take that which Jesus was talking and speaking about and reveal that to those who were listening and hearing. So his job as the Holy Spirit is to take the words of God and make them known to you so that it can change you. You and I are fighting against spiritual forces driven by evil and by Satan. We're not going to overcome them by our own power. We have to be in the power of the Spirit of God, not in the Spirit of man. Our natural words will do nothing to stop the advance or attacks of the evil one. Our natural human words will not change a circumstance. What changes it is the power of the Word of God. Remember this armor and weaponry was given to us by God to stand against the forces of darkness, both as a church and as an individual when we stand against the wiles of the devil. This is the sword that the Spirit uses and that He gives us to use, which is, the Bible says, the Word of God. Of God. Here's something just kind of a, a little interesting note that this is the only place that I know of in the New Testament that has a, has a double 
I don't know what you would call, I mean, a, a quadruple emphasis on a particular idea. And that, that quadruple emphasis is the Apostle Paul says, stand. It's standing. It's standing, 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 standing. He said that so many times to make sure you and I understand this weaponry is designed for us to stand against something that's trying to come against us. And we move together as a force when we stand in agreement and we stand together. In the Greek... Um, there's more than one word used to define the Word of God. As we know, the New Testament was written in Greek and Aramaic, and it was what many of the people in their day spoke, the language that they spoke. And uh, so we are going to look at two words that I want to point out, and I believe knowing the meaning of these two words can help us understand and experience its application in our lives in a, in a greater way um, than we did before. The two Greek words used for this word, word of God, are the words rhema and logos, or logos, however you want to say it, if you've never heard those two terms. And what we see is, is the, the logos is the universal word of God that is written or spoken, in other words, that reveals and communicates God's will on a matter, the big picture, the entirety of God's words written or spoken to you and I, while rhema is the Word of God the Holy Spirit quickens to us personally for a specific purpose or situation. So it's something specific. It's like what he's talking about, this sword. The Logos is a well of water, while rhema is a bowl of water from that well. The Logos are all the keys on a piano, while rhema is a single key on the piano. So it's something specific. Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words says this. He said, explains that the rhema is the individual scripture which the Spirit brings to our remembrance for use in a specific time of need. One thing. Sword, one sword that can be used against a specific target, a specific thing at one time. The prerequisites of this, of course, being the regular storing of the Word of God in your heart and mind. Because if it's not there, the, the, the Holy Spirit can't bring something to your remembrance as Jesus promised that He would if there's nothing there to bring to your remembrance. It's kind of like you, you know, you know, thinking you can't study for a test when you're a kid and go in and take a test the next day and pray and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal, to re help bring th th things to your remembrance when you never read the book. You're, you, God can't do it. He works with you. Look at your neighbor and see He works with us. You do your part, He does His part. Your part is to get the Word of God in you. God's part is to take that Word and specifically help you use a word of God to target your situation or your need. Whatever it may be, maybe an enemy, maybe a lie, maybe this, whatever it is, it's a specific need. A rhema word from God is what brought you to salvation, is what brought you to Jesus Christ. You, the whole story of the gospel was there, but something specific spoke to you, and, and penetrated your heart and brought you to faith in Jesus Christ. And then it caused you to want to discover the bigger story. One word caused you to want to learn the bigger story. One sound of a piano causes a person to want to play the whole piano. To discover it. That's how this works. The Logos and rhema are always in alignment with one another. They're never in disagreement with each other. The reference to the sword of the Spirit in our text, and I think this is important to understand, as the Word of God is not referring to the whole Bible, the 66 books of the Bible as you and I know them. That's not what he's talking about here. Why do I know that? Because the whole Bible as we know it today was not written yet. It was not in writing. They were in the process of writing these things down that we called the letters to the 
the epistles that the Apostle Paul wrote and many of these other writers, they were writing it down. They did have the Old Testament books, but the New Testament as we know it today was just being written. So the Apostle Paul is not referencing all of that. He is referencing something specific. And I think it's important for us to understand a concept here. And, and hear me on this one because this is, a big, this is an important concept. I think what we do is that we, we cannot insert something into the text of the Word of God here that is not there. We cannot insert something in there just because we think it should be there. When it's not there, we, what we do some t- sometimes unknowingly is that we take our accumulated knowledge of God in our day, because we have the whole Bible, we have the bigger picture, we take that accumulated knowledge in our day and we assume that is what's being said in their day. We insert that into the text of their day. And in my you know, humble opinion, as far as that matters to anybody, um, this is where I think we make our critical errors of interpreting the Word of God as we interpret from our filter instead of theirs. And we, we are, we're not looking at it from their eyes or their situation. And if you remember, that's what I talked about when we've been going through the book of Ephesians, is can we find the answers to what the armor of God is in the book of Ephesians itself? Because that's the book they had, and that's who the Apostle Paul was writing to, and that's the letter they had. He's not writing them and saying, hey, you need to look at Peter's book, and, and you know, John wrote some stuff too, check it out. No, he's talking about this book that he wrote. With that said, what is meant here by the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God in our text? Paul is not talking about the written Word, his letter, or the general Word of God, but a specific, listen, a specific spoken Word. So what is he talking about? Do we have an example of this anywhere in the Bible of somebody using a spoken Word, specific spoken Word to deal with evil forces coming against them. And there are many that we have in the Bible, but my favorite, and I think is none other than the person of Jesus Christ himself. The Bible tells us that when he was baptized at 30 years of age by John the Baptist in the Jordan River, as soon as the Holy Spirit came upon him, the Bible says the Holy Spirit led him where? Into the, the wilderness to be tempted, the Bible says, of the devil. And the devil came and tempted him in three different ways. And when the devil tempted him, and we read about it in Luke chapter 4, and I encourage you to, to uh, check that out, the example that we have of Jesus being tempted by the devil. And when the devil said, I'll do this, here, why don't you do this? You're hungry. After 40 days of not eating, not drinking, you'd probably be hungry and thirsty. The devil came to him in his weak point and said, hey, you know, why don't you turn this, if you are the Son of God, turn this rock into bread. And Jesus responded. He didn't take out his Bible. He didn't grab a scroll from the temple and start whacking the devil over the head with a scroll. He spoke a specific word that was addressed to that specific temptation And he said to the devil, it is written. And what's interesting, guess what? The devil responded back to him with the word of God. He responded back to him with what he knew of the knowledge of God, but here's the difference. The devil speaks the word and lies deceit, and he uses it and he twists it. God uses the spirit of God, and what it does is it penetrates through the human heart, through the spiritual, and it brings down those things that oppose it. So it's interesting that this was a battle. Here's, here's what's important about this. Our war in the spirit is a war of words. It's a war of words. It's, that's why it's so important that we test, the Bible says words, that we test things. Is that true or is that not true? And how do we know it's true? You have to decide what your source of truth is going to be. Is it going to be Google? Well, let's just Google the answer to that. No, that's, you should probably Bible the answer to that. See, but it's, it's harder. 
It's easier just to get on the computer and type it in and go, tell me the answer. Well, no, the Word of God. We have to decide where is our truth coming from. So when we embrace the truth of the Word of God, then that becomes our source of truth, and then we have to decide if we're going to agree with it and if we're going to stand on it. That's your decision. Because this is not going to work. Listen, the Word of God will not work in your life as a sword of the Spirit if you don't believe it and you are not convinced that it's true. You can swing all day long with that sword and it will do nothing because you don't believe it. Jesus spoke it. He believed it. And the Bible tells us that the devil left him. He did not give in. He did not do it. He won the war. He won the battle. And that's what we have. In the book of Revelation, we see in verse ni- uh, chapter 19 and 15, Jesus, it says, ha- comes back with a sword in his mouth. Is that a literal sword coming out of his mouth or is that the word of God? That is the word of God. That particular word sword is not the same word, the little sword, the makara. That's actually a, like a scimitar, great big sword that's used for carrying out justice. That's designed to take off heads and, and carry out severe justice, punishment. That's the type of sword he's coming back with to deal with it. It is the Word of God that is spoken in faith, and here comes the answer that we're looking at today. Okay, so what is the Word of God the Apostle Paul is talking about? He said, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We know it's not the entire Bible. What is it? It is the Word of God that is spoken in faith. And listen, here it is. The sword of the Spirit is the applicable Word of God spoken in faith to the enemy or the obstacle that you face. So if it's fear that you're facing, or if it's a lie from the devil, or whatever it is you're facing, then that you find a scripture that specifically deals with that, and you speak that, and it becomes rhema, it becomes alive, it becomes something that will take out the enemy's forces. It will remove fear from your life, it will remove these things. And and here's what's interesting, many of us who have been in Christianity for a while, have always been encouraged to get a daily time of reading our Bibles, don't we? Read through the Bible in a year. Read, and those are wonderful, and that's the start. We've got to get knowledge. We've got to read. We need to be consistent in reading, but one thing we're not good at. We're not good at speaking it. We're good at reading it. We may even be good at memorizing it. But how many of us walk around throughout our day and speak the Word of God? Speak it. Speak it, because the Bible tells us when we speak it, it does something to us. And it deals with the enemy. We speak to the enemy. That becomes the rhema. It becomes powerful force out of us now. This is what's interesting. It doesn't just become out of God's mouth, but it becomes alive out of our mouth. Not because it's our spirit or our words. It's God's word. Listen, God's word in your mouth Speaking in belief and faith is as powerful as God's word was in Jesus' mouth. The difference is we don't believe it. We don't see ourselves the same way as Jesus. But if you and I would see ourselves, the Bible says that we, the Spirit of the Lord is in us, that our spirit is the same as Jesus and He is in us, then that means His Spirit is in us and the same Spirit He used to speak against the devil and to change circumstances and situations is the same Spirit and the same sword of the Spirit that is available to you and I. But we don't speak it. Jesus did. Jesus believed it. He spoke the word, stopped the storms. Spoke the word and trees died. I mean, that's the funniest story ever. You know, to you and I, it looks funny. He comes out of the building and goes, I'm hungry. Tree didn't have any fruit on it. You're dead. I'm hungry. There's no fruit on you. You're history. But, of course, he was a, it was a spiritual example of what he was talking about with his disciples and what was going to happen. But, he, but he, used to, he had the power of the Spirit. He had the power of the Word of God to change circumstances, and that's what we need to understand. The sword of the Spirit is the applicable Word of God spoken in faith to the enemy or the obstacle. 
It's not just getting what you say out of your mouth. Listen, this is not name it and claim it. This isn't, oh, I I want this, so I'm going to take the Word of God and speak it, and I'm going to have a new car. No. That's not what we do. God gave us the Spirit, the, the Word of God, to propagate the gospel, to advance the message of the gospel, to stand against the lies of darkness and the deceit of the devil. That's what he gave us, the sword of the Spirit. That doesn't mean that he doesn't bless you in your life. He wants you blessed. How many of you believe that God wants you blessed? Absolutely he does. Sure he does. He loves you. You're his children. You as a parent, do you want your children going through life just having a terrible time, or do you want them blessed? Of course you do. But that's not God's first goal. Propagating of the gospel is God's first goal. The stemming of the tide of darkness The kingdom of God manifesting on the earth as it is in heaven. That's his first goal. So you and I, if we're in agreement with him, then that's why we speak the word of God. And then the benefits come later. Isn't that what he said? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things will be added to you. In other words, God's saying, "If if, if you will follow my plan and you'll be concerned about my plan, I'll be concerned about yours. But get the priorities right first. His, then yours. And God will love you and he'll take care of you. That's why it's so important for us to understand. We meditate on the word of God. We get it into our heart, not just our heads, so that we can speak it. And lastly, Hebrews 4.12 tells us that the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword in Hebrews 4.12, piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow and is discerning of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The word of God doesn't just work against the enemy, it will get you too. That's what brought you to Christ. The sword of the Spirit penetrated your heart, your thinking, your natural mind, even though it didn't feel logical, it doesn't seem to make sense to believe in some dude who died on a cross 2,000 years ago, and you're putting your hope and faith in eternity in this guy. I mean, think about it logically. Does that make any sense to you? No. That's why it had to be God. And that's why you believe it. Because it penetrated past your natural mind, and it touched your spirit. And that connected with God, and your life has changed. The natural mind is what? An enemy of God. Doesn't want to believe the word of God. So that's why we have to believe it and we have to speak it so it affects our mind. Both the Logos and the Rhema are crucial to the Christian life. For God uses his word to speak his Rhema to us and we do the same in our spiritual battles. Look at your neighbor and say, we speak the word to change our circumstance. That's what we do. It's not enough to just read it. Knowledge is great, but that's not going to win the battle and win the fight. Use the word, use the sword by speaking the word of God to your enemy into your situation and believe it and trust it by faith. The Apostle Paul is telling this church, look people, here we go. This church is going, okay, what do we do? He's got, we got this letter. He's given us all this information. We're, we're up against it. We're having all these false teachers come in. We're having all this stuff. And he's telling them, what do we do? What are we supposed to do here? He goes, he's telling them, you don't have to remember every single thing I said. You're going to learn that through time. But all you need to do is remember a few things that I said. If you remember these, a couple of specific things and stand on them, that will become your sword. And you use that sword against things that come against you, come against you and tell you that you have to work more to be loved by God. No, you don't. In other words, you use a specific word to come against a specific target. That's what the Apostle Paul was encouraging his people to do. He was encouraging the entire church, when these philosophies come against them, they need to stand on the word that they had specifically that said Jesus is the only way to heaven. Not all this other stuff. One thing. Speak that, speak that, and then it trickles down to the church and to the people and arms them with the same sword the church is preaching and teaching and the, gra- the people grab it and use the sword too. So it worked for the whole church and it came and became alive to the people of the church in their daily lives. 
And that was the plan of Paul as he wrote this letter to the whole church. Amen? Well, let's stand together today and let's pray. Father, we thank you today that as a church, a body of believers, we are armed with the armor of God because a body of believers, a church is a body, is a group, is a people, is a living organism. We have a head to this church and his name is Jesus. And there are members to this church and each of us fulfill a different function. There are arms and legs and feet and heart and all of this, but we know that we follow Christ. He is the head of the church and we have armor. And you've given us as a church the weapon of the Word of God through the Spirit to deal with enemies that come against us and come against the people of this church. And we thank you, Father, as we speak the Word, it becomes a powerful tool to penetrate hearts, to penetrate the darkness, and to help us stand against those forces, those principalities, and those powers that try to stop us from moving forward and advancing the gospel. We thank you, Lord, that we don't put our trust in you, but we put our trust in, I mean, we don't put our trust in ourselves, we put our trust in you. And every time we put on the Lord Jesus Christ, we put on the armor of God. And we praise you for this. In his name we pray. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have an awesome day. Don't forget, as you're out and about shopping, grab us some candy and stuff for all the uh, kiddos in a couple of weeks. God bless you. Enjoy your day.